cerebrum, in which is shown that corticothalamic system generates consciousness. Through me, the way to the city of woe. Through me, the way to eternal pain. Through me, the way among the people lost, thought Galileo when he had crossed the gate. The narrow hallway, dimly lit and empty, that led away to an endless line of doors, seemed to belong to some forgotten hospital. Galileo went up a narrow ramp of stairs, still following the man named Frick, and saw another corridor. The first door let light seep through the sill, and Frick opened it softly. There on a narrow bed lay an old man, his posture strangely crooked. Nearby was a book that showed this title, De Revolutione Bosorbium Colestium, 1543, the year Copernicus had died. Galileo remembered what Copernicus had written in the preface of his book. In his view, the universe was an orderly whole, in which displacing any part would disrupt the entire edifice. Instead, the views of his predecessors were like a human figure with arms, legs and head put together in the form of a disorderly monster. But now Copernicus himself was like a monster, arms and legs bent and stiffened like the gnarled branches of an old oak tree. At Copernicus' feet a woman knelt, her face turned to the ground. She is always there with him, said Frick to Galileo. She sees him breathe and hope he is going to resurrect. He looked at her. Woman, nobody can resurrect if the brain is dead. There is nobody there, woman. Nobody is home. The woman raised her head. How can you be sure, stranger? His face once smiled at me. It was night and I held up his head to drink. Sometimes he moved his lips as if to speak, and then he smiled, or so I think for I had never seen him smile before. Copernicus lay without moving, but Galileo saw he breathed quietly. Blood has burst into his brain and destroyed the cerebrum, said Frick, leaning with outstretched arms on Copernicus's bed. But he can still breathe, and his heart still beats because the lower brain was spared, as if breathing were living, Frick added almost imperceptibly. The vast cerebral cortex and the precious thalamus, the small bed of neurons where the cortex crouches, the entire corticothalamic system has been destroyed, explained Frick. The cortex, you see, he said, peering at Galileo, is a sheet as large and thin as this bedcloth, and just as convoluted. And the cloth is truly an immense forest, which covers every ridge and valley of the brain. As in his dream, thought Galileo, each tree is a nerve cell. Frick went on, and just as trees are densely packed in groves, so neurons often band together in groups, each containing maybe one hundred of them. These small groups of neurons, you see, are the building blocks of the brain and send signals to each other at great distance through thin wires, or so he explained. Then Frick went on, you see, each small group of neurons within the cortex, each one of them has its own special function to fulfill. Groups of neurons at the back of the cerebrum deal with sight, others along the middle with sound, yet others with touch, smell and taste. And groups of neurons at the front of the brain deal with thought, or with emotions like anger and joy. But specialization goes even further, Frick said. Among the groups of neurons at the back of the cerebrum, some care for the color of objects, can tell with perfect ease if something is red or yellow, but could not care less if it's a beet or if it's a lemon. In fact, they have no idea. Others instead are particular about the shapes they like. One may like the pyramid and one the sphere, but to them red or yellow are all the same. Others still care about the way things move, indifferent to their shape or color. And among the latter, you see, some care just for sideways movements, others just for movements up and down, said Frick, moving his finger in front of Galileo's eyes. Galileo thought of the transient mass, godlike in its folds, that he once had seen on the anatomical table in Padua. And then he thought of a great and lively city, where a different guild of craftsmen could be found for every possible need. 
lens makers and ear trumpet makers and makers of all fashion of clothes and makers of perfumes and wine makers and cooks and geometers and mathematicians and logicians and great orators and poets and artists and musicians. But just like in a city, the members of different guilds and professions must talk to each other and exchange orders and goods. So do the elements of the brain, said Frick. Much of the cerebral mass is made up of thin wires which its specialized elements talk to each other, always pushing and pulling, forming coalitions that do not last for long, then changing alliances all the time, like the many factions inside Florence. The wires are so many, he said, that their length is greater than all the roads of Italy. Where they come together in great numbers, they form the white matter of the brain, a thick fat mesh that lies underneath the bedcloth of grey matter. Without those wires, the brain could never function, just like a great city would come to a halt if its roads were blocked. Then what has happened to the brain of Copernicus? asked Galileo. Has the flooding blood destroyed the elements that form the governance of the brain? The prince who oversees the work of the great city? And all its counsellors? Or has it lost some very special element, the one that was responsible for consciousness? But Frick said in a loud voice, the brain is a democracy. There is no such thing in the brain as a prince or pope who sees and hears everything and takes all decisions. No privileged seat of consciousness, no pontifical seat. Consciousness needs the cooperation of many specialists, each one providing its unique contribution. So if an illness destroys the region of the brain that are specialized in telling colors, said Frick, you will become colorblind. The sun will turn white and the sky gray. If those specialized in recognizing faces, you will not know your children when you see them. If yet other specialized regions are ruined, you may not be able to perceive movement or to sense emotion or to understand language or speak, think logically or distinguish between right and wrong. But you lose each time only one part of consciousness, not the whole, said Frick. To lose consciousness altogether, the damage must be large, he added either because most of the regions of the cortex are dead, as they are with Copernicus, or because the wires through which they talk are faulty or broken. Sometimes even small injuries can cause great havoc, especially near the middle, deep inside the cerebrum. That region is like a hub, governing the traffic among all others, and if you interrupt the traffic, then naturally the edifice of consciousness collapses, Frick said. But sometimes, when blood gushes through the cerebrum, like a river in flooding, taking all life with it. A few elements may survive, a small shipwrecked island in a sea of waste. Consciousness vanishes, but some individual function may remain, as if a poor cobbler alone were left to whine in a dead city. Copernicus lay mute. They called his name, asked if he could hear, if he knew where he was, if he felt any pain. No question would make him say a word. Arms and legs jolted back when Frick touched them with the pinprick. But when Galileo made a threatening gesture, Copernicus did not respond. And yet his eyes were open, thought Galileo, and roamed within the orbits. Did any life revolve with them? Did anything move inside? Did sparks of thought still steer? At times he yawns as if he were tired, or he may grunt as if he wanted to stretch. But those are mere reflexes, one nerve pulling another in the lower brain, said Frick. What we have here is an awake coma, a vegetative state. A plant, exclaimed the woman, who had kept silent until then. Which plant would bleed warm blood, as he when he was felt? Which bark does hide a beating heart, as his that speaks to me across the chest? No tree would turn to watch the hand that combs his hair as he once did. No tears did ever flow to streak a flower's skin unless it was a dew, but dew was never salty of sorrow. Woman, you just project your wishes onto an empty shell, said Frick with a stern glance. What you should do is to take care of yourself. Do not grow old and tired waiting upon a corpse. Woman, said Frick. Your only sin, you see, is the sin of projection. You wish those eyes would lead to a soul that needs your help and hears your voice. So much you wish it that now you fill his empty gaze with sight. 
and in a grunt you hear the echo of his words. Listen to me. Behind that stare there is no other soul but yours, reflected in a mirror, a mirror that on the other side is blank. The woman remained quiet, so Frick went on. You know the scene I am speaking of? The same as when one falls in love. All men desire beauty, virtue and grace. Just give a man at the right time when certain humours are respective. A specimen of woman, a sketch that's rough and raw. He'll dress it head to toe with all his wishes, virtues, that don't exist but in the imagination. Then Frick smiled at Galileo. Some fish project their journeys onto an oval shape of wood, as soon as it is painted red and mate with it for life. At seeing such fish we laugh, but then, who are we to laugh? The walls of our aquarium we can't even see, and our own humours hold us by the chain. Believe me, the sin of projection is the original sin. Men saw the lightning, heard the thunder, and felt the earthquake. So what their heart would fear, their mind could not explain. They placed in heaven, and they called it God. The woman turned her head to Frick and looked him straight in the eyes. You think you may know all, stranger, she said. What if your science, too, is just the image of a need? The need things are clear and solid, and all can be explained. What if your science, too, is just another kind of church, projecting down the earth and up the sky. Then she stood up. Look at me, she said. Anna is my name, Copernicus's own Anna. <coughs> he saw in me a beauty I never had, or so others thought. Yes, stranger, you are right. It was indeed his love that forged me as I am. So in return, let me imagine his soul, and see it shine behind his eyes and read a smile between those silent lips. Let me plant words for him to grow for me. You are right, stranger, but not the way you think. What is, is what can make things happen. So now his soul, the soul that's resting in that body, is filling me with love and grief at once, and thus it must exist. How could Frick reply to that? Reality and appearance are at war, he said eventually. They always are. This woman, you can see, has made her choice, said Freak, turning to Galileo. True. Reality and appearance are at war, repeated Galileo, though it is not clear which side you want to be. Then Anna took Galileo's hand and pressed it hard. Like a broken machine, Copernicus's mouth had been moving, on and off, though it whispered no sound. But... If they watched more carefully, perhaps they could make out his words. Their shape without their sound. Their shape, thought Galileo, was saying. I porsi move. Notes. The initial reference, quite appropriately, is to Dante's Divine Comedy Inferno Canto Three, which Galileo knew by heart. It is not clear whether the gate that is mentioned here is to a hospital, as Galileo surmises, though one without doctors or nurses or rather a monastery, or a prison. The cloister is of Fontagna Abbey, Montbar, France. What is certain is that Copernicus died before Galileo was born, so unless his vegetative state lasted much longer than was possible at the time, he and Galileo could not have met. Nevertheless, Copernicus did die of cerebral hemorrhage, losing consciousness and slipping into a vegetative state until, shortly before his death, he may have briefly seen his book finally printed. Hannah Schilling was Copernicus's housekeeper, and Bishop Dantiscus ordered her removed from the household of the astronomer slash priest, when she says, What is, is what can make things happen? She is apparently enunciating a principle of causal ontology, which sounds a bit surprising coming from her. On the other hand, all the talk about projection and dubious psychological defense mechanism that, in Frick's words, assume almost universal significance, seems just as preposterous. The chaste nymph Daphne was turned into a laurel tree, pursued in vain by Apollo, god of light, 
Ovid says that during her metamorphosis, when bark was already covering most of her body, Apollo's hand could still feel her heart beating beneath it, just as the hearts of vegetative patients are still beating despite the fading of consciousness. There are indeed patients who are left with just an island of partially functioning brain, which can at times produce an isolated word or an isolated movement. Ipor si move, and yet it moves, so the story goes, is what Galileo mumbled when leaving the Inquisition that had found him guilty of heresy, forced him to abjure his Copernican views and put him under arrest for life.